Good morning. My name is Donna Gonzalez, and on behalf of First Unitarian Church of Wilmington, Delaware, I welcome you to our online worship service. We wish to welcome all of you into this virtual sanctuary and into this community that values your individuality, inclusion, loving kindness, and justice. It is good to have you with us. We also welcome our guest minister, Reverend Kimberly Debus. Reverend Debus works as a community minister based in New York's capital region, inspiring an artful and art-filled faith. She consults with congregations and religious professionals and provides sabbatical ministry support throughout the denomination. She was a learning fellow at the Church of the Larger Fellowship and has served congregations on the North Fork of Long Island and Key West. In addition, we are also pleased to have pianist Linda Henderson with us. And now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. My name is the Reverend Kimberly Debus, and I invite you to breathe deeply as we enter our time of worship with these words from Gretchen Haley. Let's not go building new walls around our hearts. We have already enough that keeps us from each other, enough that keeps us from ourselves and the knowing of all that we have done, all that has been done to us and for us the losses we sustained, the love we avoided, the life we held too tight. For this hour, we practice showing up with a willingness to see, to be seen, to remember ourselves whole and still becoming better. To believe it is okay to not be okay, that we are loved even when we feel unlovable, that we belong even when the ground comes out from under us. To be for each other a surprising generosity, a sudden sweetness, a sign of hope, the start of a new day. Together we can be this brave. I invite you now to light a chalice or candle near you as I light this one. Come, let us worship together.
Please join me in affirming our mission. First Unitarian Church of Wilmington is a beloved community that nourishes minds and spirits, fights injustice, and transforms the world through loving action. Now make yourself comfortable while Reverend Debus leads us in prayer. I invite you now into a time of meditation and prayer with these words from Tamara Labak. Holy One, who has given us the breath of life, today we remember to breathe deeply, to rest, to take in, to pause before we act, and then to take in another deep breath, poise on the edge, and risk jumping in, risk taking action, risk speaking up, risk using the gifts we have been given, so that at the end of our life we can say with absolute clarity that no part of our existence was wasted in fear of failure or fear of success. Hold us. Prepare us the way to begin to offer the gift of our awakened presence, full of love and light today. These and the prayers of our hearts we lift up now in the silence. I invite you to say aloud the name or names of people who need our care and concern. May all whose names were spoken and those unspoken Find peace and healing today.
Our reading is a sonnet by Herbman Melville, the author of Moby Dick and a Unitarian. In placid hours well-pleased we dream of many a brave unbodied scheme, but form to lend, pulsed life create, what unlike things must meet and mate, a flame to melt, a wind to freeze, sad patience, joyous energies, humility, yet pride and scorn, instinct and study, love and hate, audacity, reverence, these must mate and fuse with Jacob's mystic heart to wrestle with the angel art. My life flows on in endless song. Endless song. Not endless chatter, not endless Zoom meetings, not endless laundry, although, well, that's real. But endless song. Something creative, artistic, something beyond words, something that transforms us. We all know that song or film or play or painting that touches our souls. It might be the song a parent sang to us when we were scared, or the scene of a film that speaks our truth, or a sculpture in a favorite museum that is permanently etched into our memory. If I were to ask each of you to describe a moment in worship that has stuck with you, chances are it will be a piece of music or a story or skit, or some object or painting. When we think about art that way, they stop being simply objects, a painting, a song, a play. And as musician Brian Eno suggests, they become triggers for our experiences that transport us to a time of joy or comfort or ease. Suddenly, it is well with our souls because of art's power, which is mysterious. We can't know for sure what moves us when we see a famous play or a painting or a dance, but we know the one that captures our attention and makes us wonder and lets us consider our humanness and our connection to the divine and our profound dance with life and our interconnectedness with the world. In fact, we are so moved by the arts, we create artistic places to house and engage them, from the Guggenheim to the Sydney Opera House. We are so moved by the arts that despite our austere Puritan forebears, we cannot help but put art in our places of worship, from stained glass in the windows to paintings on the walls. We are so moved by art, we write songs about art, like Mona Lisa, and songs about artists, like Vincent, and even entire musicals about art, like Sunday in the Park with George. So what is it about art? Poet Elizabeth Alexander writes that art replaces the light that is lost when the day fades, the moment passes, the evanescent extraordinary makes its quicksilver. Art tries to capture that which we know leaves us as we move in and out of each other's lives, as we all must eventually leave this earth. Great artists know that shadow work always against the dying light, but always knowing that the day brings new light and that the ocean, which washes away all traces on the sand, leaves us a new canvas with each wave. That shadow and light isn't just out in the natural world. It is the essence of humanity, and the arts help us see this evanescent in ourselves and each other, and helps us tell our human stories. Even the most abstract painting is telling some sort of story. And story is what moves us. As Jonathan Gottschalt, author of the storytelling Animal Rights, 
story continues to fulfill its ancient function of binding society by reinforcing a set of common values and strengthening the ties of common culture. It defines the people. It tells us what is laudable and what is contemptible. It subtly and constantly encourages us to be decent instead of decadent. Story is the grease and glue of society. By encouraging us to behave well, story reduces social friction while uniting people around common values. Story, he concludes, makes us one. The human mind was shaped for story so that it could be shaped by story. Science has shown us that when we hear or watch or read stories, not only are the language or visual processing parts in our brain activated, but any other area in our brain that we would use when experiencing the events of the story are activated too. As science writer Leah Woodrich notes, whenever we hear a story, we want to relate it to one of our existing experiences. That's why metaphor works so well with us. While we are busy searching for a similar experience in our brains, we activate a part called the insula, which helps us relate to that same experience of pain or joy or disgust. Storytelling happens throughout the arts, whether television, film, books, dance, sculpture, stand-up, or painting. Stories emerge. Our stories. Human stories sometimes joyful stories, but oftentimes hard, tragic stories. Art helps us tell the hard human stories in ways that address the untenable without our knowing it. Art brings us up against things we have a hard time facing in real time, but never says explicitly, here's the scary part. Rather, Art provides a structure that allows us to peel off layers and go just a little bit deeper each time we engage it. This is especially important as we encounter the stories of those who are not like us. But artistic structures help make space so we can approach the difficult stories sideways. Art creates a shared experience through which we can connect and understand and empathize in relative safety. As playwright George Bernard Shaw quipped, without art, the crudeness of reality would make the world unbearable. Or the words of acting teacher Stella Adler, life beats down and crushes the soul, and art reminds you that you have one. And right now, we need that reminder more than ever. Dr. Kimberly Norris, an authority on confinement and reintegration at the University of Tasmania, says that we've moved from the first quarter of isolation, a time of panic buying and confusion, to the second quarter, the honeymoon, where it felt novel and different as we learned new technology and enjoyed working in pajamas and learned who delivered but now we're in the third quarter, a time of loneliness, a time of hollow-eyed stares, odd fixations, and brooding resentments. According to studies of how long humans can survive in space, moods drop after the halfway point of a mission. And when there's unclarity about when a time of isolation will end, it is even harder because while there seem to be glimmers of hope, in our case, a seemingly flattening curve. The uncertainty of how long this will actually last means that this third quarter could last a really long time. Our moods are suffering. We're getting snippy and intolerant. We're looking into the future and wondering when and if we can celebrate birthdays and holidays and go on vacations and attend concerts and return to worship services in the same room with one another. And those long looks at the calendar bring a sense of futility. We are in what is called a liminal space, an in-between time. And we're not good at these kinds of spaces, not for very long anyway. Our lives right now flow on in endless anxiety 
and fear and frustration. A fear and anxiety and frustration that is only further amplified by the protests and the state of our world outside of the pandemic. We need art. We need the art of theater being streamed from Broadway and the West End and other locations. We need the art in museums available in virtual tours so we can spend minutes or hours in the Louvre or the British Museum or the Met. We need the art of our musicians who are holding online concerts, sometimes weekly. We need the art of our storytellers, books, movies, television, poetry, even story times, all available in our homes or streaming or otherwise online. We need the art of our natural world to immerse in gardens and landscapes. And we need to not just view it, but to make it. The truth is we are all artists. Process theology suggests that just as God is both creator and creating, we too are both a part of creation and are creators. And the moments of creation are the true reality. Feminist theologian Carter Hayward suggests that God is nothing other than the eternally creative source of our relational power, our common strength, a God whose movement is to empower, bringing us into our own together, a God whose name in history is love. And And I suspect some of you are there thinking, I'm not an artist. Perhaps you could never coordinate your feet properly in dance class and you gave up thinking you're a klutz. Perhaps you had a music teacher who suggested it would be best if you just mouthed the words. Perhaps you had an art teacher who fussed because you used the wrong colors. Perhaps you had an English teacher who said your story was uninteresting and your poem made no sense. Perhaps, like me, you had a director who told you you ruined the play because you really couldn't act. We get these horrible messages often in childhood that keep us from creating, that keep us from breathing in the smell of paint and makeup and sweat and graphite, that keep us from entering the world and telling our stories through the act of creation. I encourage you, I implore you to create It doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to be for public consumption. Write bad poetry that you burn in the grill. Draw awkward pictures on the margins of your notepads. Sing off key in the shower. As the famous quote says, dance as if no one is watching. You see, engaging in the creation of art Whatever form it takes gets our creative selves energized to tackle other tasks. Whether it be homeschooling our children for the foreseeable future, caring for an aging parent, or staying safe and healthy as an essential worker, or more, going onto the front lines of protests or supporting protesters or teaching young minds, or dismantling racism, or resisting hate, or reversing the effects of climate change. And let me be clear, art and justice are not separate. After the death of Aretha Franklin, Dr. Takaya Amin said, please, can we understand her singing and her activism as one and the same as parts of each other? Can we resist the urge of seeing the creative and performative as somehow separate from the political and impactful? It is all connected. Allowing yourself to be a little artistic will allow you to creatively draw the circle of love ever wider, to dismantle racism, to side with love in the face of hate and oppression, to care for the planet and all the people on it. And in the process, you will discover a new connection to a part of yourself, that part that reminds us that we are incredibly human 
and deeply connected to one another and to the divine. We can't let our anxiety about art and the old messages of perfectionism stop us more than ever when the world feels out of control and the problems we face are so big they are paralyzing. We need to create. I close with these words from the Reverend Micah Busey, these words of of encouragement. Dear curious and creative potential prophets, we are ready for you. Let's be clear, art doesn't immediately change things. We have to wrap our brains around that lest we get too full of ourselves. Art doesn't stop violence or erase pain or eradicate evil. It doesn't turn back time or protect bodies. Art doesn't do big things and that's why no one will sustainably fund it. Art is actually a very small thing that does very small things. It's a gathering of tiny revolutions that sustain the larger ones. Its power comes from being minuscule and undetectable. Art doesn't stop the violence, but it starts the questioning of violence. Art doesn't erase the pain, but it names the pain. Art doesn't eradicate evil, but it tells the queer stories of another way. It stops time and protects souls because its power is microscopic and the empire only knows how to deal with things it thinks it sees. You will start to create something today because you feel galvanized and then you will hate it tomorrow and then you will think you have nothing to offer and then you will stop creating for a few days and then... Something teensy will spark, and then the whole cycle will start again. This is the reality of tiny things in a world that only responds to gigantic, blustery, bloated things. This is the plight of prophecy, and it truly sucks. But my cat just jumped on the keyboard and typed out nigged. And if my cat, who stays pretty apolitical most days, is taking this opportunity to use the devastation of this time and create something out of it, I can only imagine the astonishing things you have up your sleeves. Amen.
Stewardship is financial, of course, but it is more about encouraging the spiritual growth and search for truth and meaning. I want to thank Nancy Pinson and Cindy Cohen for putting together the slideshow we had just enjoyed that featured past contributions to the First U Art Gallery. The Art Gallery has often focused on the monthly Soul Matters themes, such as renewal, but has included other displays as well, such as a Patchum and Terrace Youth and Children's Peace Traveling Art Exhibit. In this way, we have been able to highlight the unique contributions members of the First U have been able to make. The goals of the Art Gallery are to inspire creative among, creativity among our members, present an expanded perception of religion, church, and spirituality, better appreciate the artists as members of our First Unitarian community, and support the artist and the art lover by providing space to show and enjoy art. Due to the pandemic, we will offer the art gallery online. We are looking for all forms of artistry, sketchers, painters, sculptors, ceramicists, phot photographers, crafters, poets, and writers. Members may email photos of their creations. See the weekly e-news for more information. We ask you to support with your talents and treasures First Unitarian's efforts to provide these opportunities for spiritual growth through the arts. Now let us say together our offering words. To the work of this congregation, which is weaving a tapestry of love and action, we dedicate our lives and these our offerings. close with these words from the Reverend Jim Keat. Creativity is not a thing. It's the way you approach and engage everything. Creativity is not a product that can be bottled and sold. It's simultaneously the fuel and subversion of capitalism. Creativity is not an activity that you start and stop. It's a mindset, a filter, a way on which you see the world. So go in love, go in joy, go in peace, go and be creative. While we have spent time together and apart in this sacred space, the words spoken by Reverend Debus have come true. You have experienced many art forms wherever you are right now. They may have touched your spirit through your own creative mind giving meaning to the lighting of a candle, the shape of the chalice, musical meditation, the warmth of being together, though afar apart, and more. As I extinguish this chalice, and as we leave the sanctuary, may we promise ourselves to put the words into action that were spoken today, bringing more beauty and joy into our lives and the lives of others.